Hi, it's Dr. Lori. Can you pick the most valuable? I'm gonna look at all of these different objects, ashtrays, dolls from the 1970s, couple of pieces of glass, all kinds of stuff. Let's see if you can pick the most valuable. These are the types of things that you might find at your thrift store, right? When you're shopping. I want you to know what to look for, right? When you're looking at something so you can decide right there on the spot, okay, I'm buying this and this is a bargain or I'm not buying it and let it go. You know, that kind of thing. So I'm gonna show you these things. Let's get started. Let's start right here with the Charlie Brown and Lucy Peanuts character dolls. All right now, typically the first thing I always tell you guys is, hey, if it's a set, I wanna keep the sets intact. Right? So there are two of these dolls by the Charles M. Schultz, right? So the United Features Syndicate that had the comic strip of Peanuts. The most popular was, of course, Snoopy, Charlie Brown's little dog. He was always taking a nap, right? So these particular dolls are from the latter part of the 1950s, early 1960s. They have their original costumes, and they have, the, of course, their original tags on those costumes. Condition's going to be important. I don't care what you're looking at. Condition is going to be important. I say it all the time you got to look for condition. People are looking at tags and people are looking at generations of tags and all different kinds of stuff. I want you to look at condition too, right? And marks are important, but condition is important. So the Charlie Brown and Lucy Peanuts character dolls are one of a set of four dolls, but they're missing some in this particular group. So value on them about $20 each or $40 for the pair. So it might be better if you're selling them for you to sell them individually as opposed to, of course, together as only a pair because it's more obvious that, well, you know what, we don't have the whole set of four. So think about that. That's a good selling tip. The next piece I want to tell you about is a piece of Vaseline glass. Now you've heard Vaseline glass, also called uranium oxide glass. So Vaseline glass has that kind of color that's similar to Vaseline or petroleum jelly. But the reason why we see Vaseline glass and it is so rare is because Vaseline glass, in fact, is a relatively collectible piece. It kind of fluorescents under black light. I know you all love black light. I'm not a big advocate of black light. Use it if you want. I think if you can learn how to educate your eyeballs, right, looking at these objects, you're not really going to need particularly the black light all the time. It's pretty easy to identify. It has that two-tone color. It's usually a lime yellow or a lime green kind of color, Vaseline glass. It's very collectible and desirable. Some of the more... Um, uh, decorative pieces, really intricate, complex pieces can be very, very expensive. This piece right here, this example, which is a tripod leg nut dish, right? So candy or nut dish worth about $60 retail. And all my values as always are based on an actual sales record where something is sold. So if you're trying to sell something and everybody else is selling it for a different number, yes, you have to know the market, but you also have to think about, hey, there might be somebody out there who really wants this piece and is willing to pay a little bit more than what market is. My value is always based on actual sales records. That's how you get an accurate appraisal. And if somebody wants to buy something from you, they're probably not giving you an accurate appraisal. Remember that too. Anyway, this next piece I really think is really interesting because it actually is a, a piece of jewelry that you wear around your waist. So it's a belt. It's about 30 inches long. So it would go around the waist and then kind of hang down a little bit. It's a gold tone piece with carved scarabs. Now a scarab is a little beetle and it dates back to the ancient Egyptian time. These little beetle pieces are basically carved out to look like those beetles in all different types of semi-precious stones. So stones like chalcedony, stones like onyx, lapis lazuli for blue, uh, jade, all different types of stones, tiger's eye. And then they're in different sizes, some bigger than others, and they relate to this idea of the scarabs. Scarabs were worn by Cleopatra, it was thought, in the ancient Egyptian world, and she would wear it as like a necklace. So the beetle would be like a necklace. I'm not big on insects at all. I hate bugs. I think they're going to take over the world. I don't like bugs. But they were a very, very popular decorative element on jewelry throughout the history of art. Having said that, this particular piece is really a beautiful piece. It's wonderful, it's collectible. It dates to the early years of the 20th century and value on this particular piece, $750. It's gorgeous and big. So, makes a real statement, as they say. The next piece is a piece which has a historical background. 
Whenever I tell you about these objects and I tell you what to look for, I tell you about quality and collectability and what's valuable, how the market likes a piece. The market likes history, likes history a lot. This particular ashtray, while we don't see ashtrays and tobacco and a selling very high at all, this particular ashtray is relatively collectible because of its connection to history. This piece shows two figures, Uncle Sam and a Toreador, or a bullfighter. And the bullfighter represents Spain, and Uncle Sam, of course, represents the United States. And the idea here is that they're kind of fighting over a cigar with the word Cuba on it, fighting over the great Spanish colony. Now, I've been to Cuba twice. It's a wonderful and interesting place. You know, I, I drove in the old cars that I didn't think would make it very far, but it did. And, you know, it's a really wonderful place, a Spanish colonial site. That was the site where all of the Spanish galleon ships with all the treasure in it would actually leave from. They would leave from the port of Havana, Cuba to go from the Caribbean back to Spain and bring all the money back to the King of Spain. So back to our ashtray. This particular ashtray is a pretty good example. And because it has a historical connection, because it relates to the Spanish-American War, right, us fighting with Spain over particular colonies, this particular ashtray is worth $75. It's a piece of ceramic. On the back, you will see that it doesn't have a lot of, of information, but it does have the bright white clay, the porcelain, and it is hand painted. But it's the figures and what the figures represent where the value is. Always remember, history drives the market. The next piece I want to talk to you about is this little sweet oatmeal bowl. So kids collectibles well kind of it's an it's a bowl for oatmeal or a bowl for farina or did you have cream of wheat i liked cream of wheat you know i grew up in new england and there were a lot of those hot cereals in the morning growing up so this one actually the idea was to get to the bottom of the ocean so you'll notice the ducks and you can see the ducks on the on the blue ocean or on the blue pond and if you ate all your farina you would get to the bottom and that was the idea this piece is made by the Stangle Company in New Jersey. And New Jersey Stangle is really, really well known. Actually, in the 1940s, it was one of the early um, in, in people, early for, firms that actually introduced, of course, that idea of hand painted dinnerware. And oh, there was the big tradition of people going to the Stangle factory before they closed in 1978 and looking through everything to see if you can get a bargain on the dishware. So that was really popular in places like Trenton, New Jersey. Stangle was in Trenton as well as in Flemington, New Jersey. They moved to Trenton. And then, in fact, they brought together two of America's most important pottery manufacturers, pottery icons even, and that was Fulper and Stangle. They worked together. So this particular example is, of course, a very general, mass-produced, large-scale, but hand-painted child oatmeal bowl with the ducks on it. Value on it, about $35. Why? Because it's made in large numbers, so that's why the value is relatively low. The next piece is a piece of crackle glass, and crackle glass is something a lot of people have from the 1960s. The 1960s crackle glass pieces are really desirable too. Now, I see the values up and down. I see people selling them for $15, and I see people selling them for $85. This particular piece of crackle glass is a pretty good example, but I want you to learn about color and form. So when you're looking at crackle glass in the thrift store, here's what I want you to look for. I want you to look for certain colors because certain colors will give more value or bring more value than other colors. That's what's interesting about it. Green, purple, amberina, will all bring purples, sometimes called amethyst glass, will all actually bring more value than some of the other colors. So the yellow doesn't sell all that well. Sometimes we see a cobalt and it goes in and out of favor. Sometimes the cobalt's in, sometimes the cobalt's out. It depends on, of course, style and such. Um, what's popular in the market that, right then, what people are decorating with right then. So what I'm looking at here is a piece of green actual crackle glass from the 1960s. It's an ewer, E-W-E-R. It's not a pitcher, okay? And here's the reason. I've got a pitcher here on my table. You notice how it's bulbous? It's big in the whole body? That's a pitcher. But an ewer actually has a kind of a slender columnar middle. So like the torso were slender, like if my torso were slender. But basically in here, it is an ewer if, if it's tight in the middle. 
That's what you see here. This piece of crackle glass is made in America. And the other thing that I want you to look for with crackle glass when you're looking at it, I want you to look for that idea of the blow pipe, right? So they're hand blown, right, in the actual furnace when the glass maker's making it. And at the back, they break that blow pipe off then they have a pontil, that's the sharp part at the bottom, right, at the underside of the piece. And that particular example will tell you that you have a hand-blown piece. So look for the pontil and look for the blow, where the blowpipe has been broken off and you'll find a nice piece of crackle glass. Crackle glass, like all different types of glass, will actually have a mineral that is actually material that'll be added to it to give it its color, right? Gold to make it red, for example. In uranium glass to make it yellow, they add the uranium oxide, that kind of thing. So that's what you're looking at here. This piece of crackle glass, this ewer, because it's an unusual shape, worth $60 retail. Then there's this piece, which everybody remembers. This is the Kermit the Frog doll. Now, the original Kermit the Frog doll, you know that puppet from Sesame Street and Sam's Friends um, by Jim Henson is in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. You can go and see it. The original Kermit the Frog doll was actually made from a, an overcoat that belonged to Jim Henson's mother and a pair of old blue jeans so the puppeteer could put his hand up the puppet's body, in fact. So this one is the 1976 version by Fisher Price Toys. There was also a Fozzie Bear that went with it and a Miss Piggy doll too. So this particular doll has a lot of connections to, of course, the green movement, of course, the ecology movement and Earth Day, for example, as well as the introduction of, of course, children's television to places like PBS and the widespread network television programming. What's important about this is that Kermit falls into many different categories when you collect. He's a toy, he's a collectible that relates to television, he's also, of course, a collectible that relates to, of course, um, eco the ecology movement or, in fact, the environmental movement, which is so important, the green movement. So you're seeing that anytime a collect an object or collectible falls into more than one category, it's worth more. So I always say, you want your, your collectibles to fall into a lot of categories because you want it to be worth more. This one's in very good condition. The materials are still really quite fine. It's made in Mexico, and that's marked on the tag. The tag being intact is important. So I know you're all ready to pull off those tags. You know, I get a new set of sheets, and they say, don't pull off this tag. Or I get a new pillow, and I say, don't pull off this tag. I'm the only person who doesn't pull off the tag, but you know, everybody else does. Don't pull off the tag. Don't cut off the tags, leave the tags where they are, especially with these collectibles. If you don't have them, it will impact value. So think about retaining the tag. Think about that, it's important. Value on this doll in this condition, one of the original ones, $250. That's the retail value for the Kermit the Frog doll from 1976 with the Jim Henson tag intact. Nice. The next one is a lacquer pin. You know, I talk a lot about travel. I love to travel. I talk a lot about souvenir collectibles. So when you're going to a place that you don't expect to be back to, what do you buy so it's a good investment, right? Or if you're at the thrift store, you know, lots of people will, you know, Mrs. Jones passes away and the family goes in and the first thing they get rid of are all of her souvenirs from a life of travel. Because I think, oh, it's just something she bought when she went to Panama, through the Panama Canal, or she went to St. Petersburg on a cruise, or she went wherever she might have gone. So I want you to think about these particular types of things. This piece is a piece, a piece of red lacquer. Now, uh, the Russians are very well known for black lacquer boxes and red lacquer boxes. They're quite desirable and collectible, but there are really high-end ones and very low-quality ones. So you're going to look for a couple of things. This is a pin, right? And it actually is a pin that is painted. It's on a piece of a little bit of wood material, and it's painted black on the back, red on the front. So you know it's not red lacquered, right? Because it's, it's not the same color on both sides. The other thing you look for is actually what type of pin has been used. This is a simple, a simple safety pin that they've actually placed into this piece, carved it out, and then just basically put some ceramic material over it so it will just stay intact. So it's just an inexpensive pin. So looking at the whole piece of jewelry, in this case, looking at the back of the pin is going to help you with respect to evaluating the pin for quality and quality equals value. Quality equals value. You have to remember that too. 
So we're looking at the materials first. This is what I want you to know because once you know this, forget it. Forget it. No one's going to beat you once you know the materials. And that's what I'm here to show you. I want you empowered so you get it. So you leave all the junk wherever you're shopping and you bring home the good stuff. Not these people who say, oh, no, you can't get this for it. Not these people who don't know how to teach you what to look for. I want you to empowered so you can make that extra money to pay the extra bill or to go out and have some fun at night. Having said that, this particular piece is hand painted, yes, but it's not done by a very good artist. Every single brush stroke is kind of the same, and it's done pretty quickly. You can see quick brush strokes in this particular manner. This piece is worth only $25. You could buy them on the streets in St. Petersburg compared to a really good, high quality piece of red lacquer wear. So, showing you the difference and comparing them is the way you're going to know what's it worth and how to identify very valuable pieces. I wonder if you picked the most valuable. I hope you did. I'm sure that you're getting better at it as we go through more videos. And I'll do more videos for you so you can see what it is and have some laughs and learn some stuff along the way. I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks for watching.